Yeah, we're going to try something completely different, another world premiere yes. um, <laughs> this afternoon. So my wife Andrea is here and she is a fabulous uh, moderator and public speaker. And so she always has wonderful tips for us when we come off stage, you know. <laughs> and we, we are remiss to not take them into we account. Cons yeah, we consistently don't take them into account. <laughs> this is the artist, producer. What, we're go what, we've seen, what we've seen Andrea do before with our mother is she has interviewed her publicly. And so what, we've, what has emerged is that Andrea is going to come here now and interview us for the first time. Because so. we want to tell you about ourselves, Yeah, but we've only got three hours. <laughs> <laughs> so the so. Old, we need a bit of the old American uh, kind of pioneering practicality to yes. come up and to try to, 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 to discern the valid information. So, um, Andrea, would you join us? Please, come on. Yeah. Andrea Osulo, everybody. Yeah. We'll put you here. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> An unexpected pleasure. Very good. Yes, Owen's uh, diagram there of the, the Celts taking the diagonal, right? Sometimes I am called so that these two take a bit more of a straight line, <laughs> just from time to time. Um, so first, I would love to ask you, everyone here has seen from their last name, from these words on the, the board here, the complexity of the Irish language. Uh, but actually, your parents were not born as Irish language speakers. I believe their parents didn't speak much Irish. They were born not as Michal O'Sullivan and Nori Nirian, but as Michael Sullivan and Nora Ryan. So what happened? Yeah. <laughs> they, our parents were the Irish equivalent of hippies. Which, which weren't very good hippies. <laughs> they were uh, around that, they were academics. They both went to college to study music and musicology. I followed in those footsteps as well, in my own studies, studying a completely different thing. But they became involved in the cultural revival of Irish traditional music in the early 70s. So our parents were born in 1950. So it became very fashionable as it did across the world in academia and in society, to return to the local, to find the individual in the universal or the universal in the specific. Also, there was a, a sense of arch a movement of archiv archivization. Archiving. Archiving. <laughs> <laughs> to go back and record for academic and ethnographic purposes the last of what remained of many Irish traditions. We, we talked about the Keening tradition earlier that actually became obsolete before our parents even got to college in the 1950s. The last Keening women at a funeral recorded was, I think, in the 1950s. So it was a time when our Irish traditional arts were waning, almost, almost, uh, almost obsolete and our parents were part of a movement to protect and return and were empowered by that. Yeah, and I think one of the profound things is that at one stage, Irish traditional culture was considered something um, backward, uh, retrogressive, uncultured, uneducated, um, repulsive actually. And the culture of the British Empire was seen as progressive, civilized. Uh, you know, if you wanted to get on in life, you had to let go of that old Irish stuff, stop droning on, and you know, learn English and dress properly and talk properly. Superstition was left go. I yeah. touch on that in, in the opening poem this morning. Uh, Nora, after the, the, the goddess Anya is said to live underneath the lake, and. Uh, our grandmother then, who was a school teacher, not a very superstitious woman. Uh, very, she married a businessman, a local businessman. They were not a very superstitious people, although there were superstitions kept. Uh, I used my poetic imagination to say that Nora maintained that she felt the goddess Anya dragging her down to her depths, an enticing urge, that, the, the, that Anya was actually uh, 
something that was expressing a darkness in her life. Now, my mom did actually tell me that our grandmother did say that, but she doesn't make any sense because our grandmother wasn't a superstitious person. But, um, but I did use that uh, to reconnect my own um, sense of superstition. And so it was always surprising to me to learn this, um, having grown up around things like river dance, right? We didn't have a sense here that it was almost a shameful thing for a certain class of people in Ireland to sing yes. in the Irish language. So your mom grew up and those parents brought in classical voice teachers and they wanted her to be a little perfect soprano and then boom, freshman year of college, she comes home singing Sean Noe's traditional song and that was a bit shocking and embarrassing. Uh, so I'd love for you to also share, why does it matter for a people to preserve and speak their own language? Your parents then went on to um, spend summers in Irish language uh, in, in places, sites in Ireland that were still indigenous Irish language speaking communities. They changed their names back to the original language. Why do that? Why maintain that uh, original language? Language is how we construct the world around us. We build uh, we build relationship and society through our language. Uh, so different societies look different in a way you could say because of their languages. Um, and when you look at someone's language, uh, you can analyze the way our inner structures are formed. So uh, a society's language, a culture's language, is in a sense how is the culture itself. And so very often, um, uh, that language can be seen as subversive and threatening. So in the Irish context, the Irish language was a subversive and threatening language to the, to the stability of the British Empire. Uh, for, for very good reason, because the Irish, well, the Irish were destabilizing for the British Empire. So um, the, at the time, the British Empire's reaction to that was to obliterate the Irish language. That was the that was the policy, you know. Uh, so that was what that that was what was enacted, and it was seen to be at the time the best thing to do, you know. And many Irish people agreed with that. Still it do. was, and, and many many still do today. Uh, see that that the Irish language is nonsense, a waste of time, backward, not needed anymore. It's a historic language, and English is the language of the world. But why is it so important? Um, I think today we, uh, per perhaps our society has gone through its obsession or its realization of a monocultural um, uh, exhaustion and exploitation of uh, the land. And when you exploit a land with one crop for too long, you lose the use, the, the, the nutrients of the land, that actually complexity is what propels growth. And uh, I would say that the biggest benefit um, to have a multiplicity of languages and cultures is actually um, the biggest benefit is maximizing growth and productivity, I would say, actually. The more difference we have, the stronger the ecosystem, yeah. Very good. Our, and, our father's academic field was tradition and innovation in, the Irish, in Irish traditional music, where, where the uh, local meets the global, where the river meets the sea. He was obsessed with the Shannon estuary as, a, as an image, and, uh, and the Irish traditional musical session as well, where many disparate people would come together and create one sound, but yet there, no one's playing in exact harmony or unison <laughs> or rhythm. So uh, tradition and innovation, yeah. Mm. And the closeness, as you said, of language and culture. Um, and I know your father, which people may or may not know, was the first uh, composer to bring Irish traditional music to the keyboard, to piano, um, and one of the first to bring Irish traditional music to orchestras um, in his compositions. And the phrase that he said more times than any of us can count is parody of esteem, right? So maybe you can tell us what did that mean to him and how does that apply to this whole weekend of your ideas? Parody of esteem in that context meant for him that all, and it's an ethnographic attitude that also became very 
fashionable in the early 70s when musicology became ethnomusicology. A parody of esteem was that no matter what the, what the geographical, chronological, or complexity of a musical tradition, that all would be placed on the same level of importance or significance. And our father was a progenitor of that in Irish traditional music and education. So our father was an educator in the third level education. He set up undergraduate and postgraduate uh, courses and modules in different um, institutions across Ireland. And they would teach Irish traditional music, classical music, and Gregorian chant, contemporary dance, ethnochoreology, which is the <coughs> studies the whys, whats, wheres, whens of dance, ethnomusicology is the whys, whats, whens, wheres of music, all on a similar parity of esteem and the same amount of module credits, the same amount of everything. No matter what your specialisation is, everyone enters into a, uh, an equality of the arts, if you will. Yeah, and ultimately I think it's if one, it's like um, when you have that great family gathering at the, at the Thanksgiving table and one member of the family starts to hog the conversation, like they always do. And, uh, uh, or that time when we were children in school and there was the schoolyard bully and you'd turn the other way when that person turned the corner in case they singled you out. Uh, and it's the same with culture. Uh, and parts of ourselves, you know, there, there can be overbearing parts of ourselves that just naturally sort of over encroach um, and block, block things out from occurring. Uh, they can be um, obsessed with uh, simplicity and obsessed with monoculture, you know, that things must be just right. When actually the reality of things behind us out the window, I mean, to, to conceive of the complexity of even uh, what is it? Yeah, you know, even a, uh, infinity in a grain of sand. You know, the, the, the extraordinary complexity of the natural world. It makes our little ant brains just seem so puny when you consider the vast complexity of even a grain of sand. So and then, yeah, we're all witness to the, the macrocosm of us perpetuating the, uh, the, perpetuating the dynamics that we want to break. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's the beautiful irony of life. Yeah, so the really the, the parity of esteem on a cultural level is saying that there, if there is one culture that's bullying, it's going to do us all damage. And if there are cultures that are unheard or ignored, um, by bringing them up and bringing them in, it'll lift all boats. And our yeah. father, sorry to interrupt, our father was born just on the cusp of the professionalization or the global entry, the globalization of Irish traditional music. The first Irish traditional professional musician is probably doing a gig right now as we sit here somewhere in the world. His name is Paddy Maloney of the Chieftains. He was the first, is the first, among one of the first several professional Irish traditional musicians in the world. So before that, nobody bought a ticket, had ever bought a ticket to an Irish traditional musical event. It would happen in the kitchens or in the pubs. It was an informal happening. And so along with those folks, yeah, your father would compose for orchestra and write into it um, the Irish pipes or different very traditional music and then put on stage. I was there once and it's Lincoln Center and the Irish orchestra has come to New York and then on stage will be a few of these deeply traditional musicians who have no formal training. Their father was a piper and now they're on stage in Lincoln Center and to do that is actually quite a radical act, I think, of saying, um, for me, it's always a reminder of we look outside for experts and we look for what is seen as the high art, the expertise, but actually we have that in ourselves, right? We all have that inheritance in mm -hmm. ourselves. Yes. Um, and there's an interesting distinction there. The, ethno, the ethnographer uh, very often can distinguish societies between oral societies or literal societies. So societies that have primacy of the word um, the written word and societies that have primacy over the spoken word. Uh, and in the Celtic world, uh, nothing was written down, very little was written down. The society absolutely saw the spoken word as the prime way to transmit information. And so a Druid had to spend 21 years studying, 
21 years studying and they would have to learn all this stuff off by by heart um, so that uh, conflict is very interesting too within us the conflict between something that demands no we have to write it down or I'll forget it and then the other side of ourselves that says actually this is so sacred that to write it down would actually damage it you know so and then at the same time, I think there's always the risk that things will be lost. Um, and at the same time that your father is doing that work, your mother after college traveled around Ireland, actually collecting songs, many of which you've already sung this weekend, that otherwise were going to be lost. I mean, she went to some of the final people who knew these songs. Our mother's masters was in Irish sacred song in the women's tradition. So Irish religious women's songs in the Irish language. Um, of which uh, a great stream of them are lamentations, of course. Uh, the, so the, mel the melodies are pre-Christian would be one of the songs we sang for you earlier, our mother introduces it as, this is one of the, is, uh, this is the oldest song in the world. That's what she says. <laughs> and it's like, everyone's like, whoa, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> It's that great Irish hyperbolic kind of. <laughs> Only an Irish mammy, only an Irish mammy can get away with that. <laughs> so the oldest, these are the oldest melodies in the world. These keenings for uh, a parent or a mother to a lost child, at losing a child. These lamentations, which then became Mary singing to Jesus, became Christianized. So she collected a good few of them. She collected a, um, a couple of other um, uh, very significant lamentations. Yeah. And it's interesting while you said that, I was just thinking that yeah, like our. Both our parents were brilliant archivists and our father was one of the founders of the Irish traditional uh, music, the Irish traditional music archive, which is one of the first, one, one of the first, based on the, the great US models here with the Smithsonian Institute, uh, one of the first national state um, traditional archives of culture. And so they were great archivists, but unless the culture is actually transmitted orally, the written culture can only be the written culture. It can never be a living culture. So uh, you must have both. Uh, you can't have only either, and you don't get to choose which one you, you don't get to choose which one you want to do. And actually, you, oftentimes, you must lean into the one you don't want to do. So um, we, what the, the great secret is that we require we're being asked to be both a literal and oral society in ourselves. You know, that parity of esteem between those sides of ourselves, yeah. And then I also wanted to ask, because this is always a great, uh, a great fun, a great aspect of fun, is you didn't just learn all this Gregorian chant from your mother. You learned it when you were at a boarding school, um, which I've often heard you describe as being just like Harry Potter. So maybe you can tell us about that. <laughs> Me and my brother were <laughs> enrolled in a boarding school uh, that was in a castle on the west coast of Ireland called Glenstall Abbey. Glenstall Abbey had 230 boys and uh, no school uniform was in the middle of nowhere on a 300 acre uh, farm. And uh, it was just like Harry Potter, just no girls, no girls. <laughs> which is uh, not as good as Harry Potter. <laughs> uh, but it was, it was good, we, earned, we learned the art of conversation and, um, and, uh, and hard work. You live with your books, so boarding school students have, you know, crossed the board a little bit higher grades than other delinquents. Um, so it, did, it, it was a beautiful place and it was also run uh, by a gr community of Benedictine monks of which has grown in the last 15 years to a, a, a group of about 55 men, I'd say, 50 men. Um, they were also old friends of our mother and father, and our mother and father produced and recorded three albums with those, that community of monks. One when Owen was two years old and before I was born, and after I was born. So our parents m were singing Irish traditional song and playing Irish traditional music, and they were playing at a charity concert in a church in County Limerick, middle of nowhere, 1979 or something maybe. And they met this group of monks, five men dressed in black habits, and they were singing at this charity event as well. And they became friends with these lads. Uh, they were speaking Irish, my parents were, so their abbot at the time, very strangely for a, 
an Irish monastery really at the time, was that Gwail Gore, a fellow who spoke Irish. So they started hanging out and there became this cultural exchange where our parents would teach them Irish traditional song, Irish women's lamentations and all of the Shannos old style song and our parents would learn from them Gregorian chant and that canon of music, some of which we have inherited through our mother. And they started doing this and singing together, one female voice and around 10 of a scola of Benedictine monks. It's kind of like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs <laughs> kind of thing. And uh, this, of course, was the mid-80s, of course. The, the shelf title World Music was just about to be invented. The New Age was just simmering over and the music industry still existed. So <laughs> those three albums were courted by the, um, by the, by the world industry at the time. And uh, they were all disappointed, the industry, um, because this was so authentic, you just couldn't recreate it. Um, so those three albums were very fashionable in Ireland and a perfect example of the local and the global and the chronologically, the parity of esteem of, of cultures and tradition and innovation. And that's where we, me and my brother get a lot of our uh, courage to mix genres so uh, courageously, chaotically, <laughs> and um, to improvise and to have seen the power of these musical traditions and poetic traditions sit side by side in academic contexts, in poetic contexts, and in spiritual contexts. And we are innovating upon what we've gotten, which you can see why we want it moderated, because there's a lot going on. And Ireland has always been this place of pilgrimage over the centuries and the millennia. Uh, there is um, archaeology and story and mythology of Ireland being a place that you go to to sort yourself out and to reconnect to a wisdom that had been forgotten in the greater uh, peri uh, central location of yourself. You would go to this periphery where uh, a great wisdom had been stored safely out of harm's way. So that tradition, um, again, too, has been passed on in Ireland to this day. Ireland is still a place Many people, every, you know, many people say they just hit that place, that location, and there's this resonance of a sort of a very unusual sense of familiarity. And we've brought people to Ireland with no percentage of DNA, you know, and uh, they've cancelled their return ticket and um, told their told their mother that they won't be home. Look after the children for another few days. We're postponing the ticket. So Ireland has always been that place where. Um, that sense of uh, a spiritual redress can occur there. And so our parents recorded with the monks at the time in the 80s, and a certain redress was happening at the time spiritually in Ireland, um, which today uh, is not, um, it does not have the relevance it had then. So we went to school in this monastery, uh, this boarding school, and had an extraordinary time it's amazing what mischief a bunch of 30 friends can get together when they're uh, stuck with each other for you know, six years. Um, every shape and size of uh, tomfoolery can be achieved. So, um, but having, having come out of that uh, and having lived in that very unusual context, you know, where this big stuff was happening that our parents were doing with these monks, um, <laughs> we can feel a new sense of uh, redress is occurring today. And that's occurring really through people that we're meeting along the road, people like yourselves, uh, who are recognizing that there are new challenges and new types of uh, coming together that are required in our society today that's very specific for our context. So really it's an invitation, I believe our parents' story is an invitation for us and yourself, because you're here now, <laughs> is to see, well, what is that thing that is being called of us to do today? Those parts of ourselves that perhaps haven't been talking to each other. Um, how can we create that space of parity of esteem within ourselves, within our society, within our culture? So, yeah. Very good. And my last question before we give all of you a chance to ask a few questions as well. Um, I met Owen 10 years ago, so I've been around as your 
musical journey evolved and at one time, as they kind of hinted at last night, they would have their whole series of performances that was, you know, in music clubs and all their own original music. And then in the daytime, you'd go sing chant with your mother. Um, but in the last 10 years, those two parts of your musical life have completely come together. Um, and I know you describe that as really recognizing the value of the cultural inheritance that you just described for us. So how did you begin to weave all of that together and recognize that value? It's really been just taking one step after another and following invitations that have come within our orbit and having to accept other doors closing and move on down the hall. So uh, early on when we started to sing together in our early 20s, we got a lot of very exciting music industry invitations. So for example, that composer of Riverdance, Bill Whelan, had us come to his studio and he produced a demo of ours. That was pretty exciting at the time. And um, then we met Russell Crowe, an actor, you may be familiar with Russell Crowe, Australian, New Zealand actor, and he sponsored our first album, our second album. And then um, Steven Spielberg cast us in a movie. And so and these people were introducing us to all of the music industry people in LA and New York. Uh, we were like at the top, the apex of the, um, the pyramid, of the, the Illuminati pyramid. <laughs> and uh, it was extremely exciting. And, and we had no contract yeah. and, and... No, uh, we were independent. And every, everyone kind of... And all these synchronicities were happening and it was a very amazing time. And, oh. um, and we came out at that time without having signed a contract as well, which I suppose is, is testament to uh, our naivety or our wisdom yeah. can't tell. <laughs> because ultimately we learned in that world, you actually require huge, um, it's like horse racing, where you need very wealthy patrons and benefactors to promote your career. Because you know, it's pay to play. Quite literally, all the tracks you hear on the, on the, on the radio um, are bought like advertising. So the record labels buy those tracks to get on the playlist. So constantly we had to sort of generate this bigger base of patronage in order to continue to show up to, to these to meetings graduate, in yeah. LA and New York, it was so annoying. And then there were these showcases and again, you'd have to buy your slot to perform at a showcase. Um, and there were one or two contracts were coming in that we refused, we said, that's ridiculous. Um, because they asked, they want exclusivity, you know. Um, and while that was happening, Simultaneously, beautiful people were entering our lives and inviting us to sing in places of extraordinary natural beauty, and they were even giving us something called money to do it. <laughs> and uh, initially, we thought this was just a little sort of uh, momentary um, indulgence and uh, something that was taking away our intention, a distraction. Um, but eventually, we sort of hit a point where we were like, hang on a minute, where is the invitation coming from? And where is the goodness flowing? And then where are things constricting and causing tension? Um, and it was a real classic story where, you know, there was great fame and glamour and glitz on one side. And on the other side was just this very gentle, warm, simple, easy uh, path to follow, you know? So at one stage, we were living in New York City together, the three of us actually. <laughs> we lived in an apartment in New York City together. And um, we chose to stop the emails and the phone calls and chasing money and things and just open ourselves to performing for people who wanted to hear, and not just our original songs, but all of the songs that we sang and that we learned. So suddenly we were... Uh, turning to our inheritance as Irish traditional musicians, as sacred singers, as poetic apprentices. And that, uh, oh, I mean, it scared the shite out of me. <laughs> uh, excuse my French, because in the music industry, I wanted this abstracted identity. I wanted the safety getting to a hotel, getting in the elevator, going on stage, being a certain person, then walking off and going to your room and watching CNN. But in this world, that's, it's the opposite. Um, 
None of us watch CNN. <laughs> uh, but you, what people want, it's a, an admission of what people are actually inviting you to, which is to be yourself, which is something that really kind of made me have a spiritual breakdown in a lot of ways, you know. And uh, finally owning up to the, the weight of the inheritance. Because I became a rapper and a beatboxer and a popular singer. I still sing a lot of jazz, but, you know, with kind of messages in it. And um, that was scary for us to fully drop down to be a very serious uh, role model of some sort. <laughs> Uh, by being yourself so radically. It's a scary thing, and I wasn't, certainly wasn't prepared for it. I would have preferred, I thought I, I thought I wanted, of course, this abstracted identity, this industry road that we've all, all uh, impaled ourselves upon at different times in our lives. Um, Very good. So often, at the end of these workshop days, all of a sudden, four people come up to me and ask me all these questions about the two of them that they haven't answered. So we thought we would leave a little time for folks to, if anyone has a question, um, really about anything, the language, their background, whatever. Yes, uh, back there and then the front row, please. I want to know the name of the, the class instrument that is. This is an Indian, an Indian instrument. Uh, from a Asian Indian, um, called a Shruti, Shruti box, S-H-R-U-T-I, a Shruti box. And it plays a drone, usually just a, to a, a, a tonic note and a fifth. And the classical Indian singers play these and sing, sing with them. So they just give that one drone and you sing to that. And so we, I, I have this because our mother went to India many times in intergovernmental exchanges between Ireland and the Indian government. And early on, she went over there and um, saw this and brought it back to Ireland. And she's been singing Irish song and sacred song with this ever since, yeah. So. She walks up and down the aisles of Catholic churches singing pre-Christian lamentations with an Indian shruti box under her arm. <laughs> While her, while her sons, her, like when we were kids, would run around the balconies. And... It sounds like bagpipes. It does sound like bagpipes, yes. Yeah, it's yeah. a reed, a reed, a reed instrument. instrument. Yeah. So. Now, right up here. I just wonder if you can explain the orthography of Celtic language. S-E-A is shot. Yeah. And Siobhan is S-I-O-B-H-A-N. Yeah. I know, yeah, well, what we're looking at there is the Roman alphabet being subs put on top of the Irish spoken oral tradition. So, um, and as well, see, what also happened, it was, it's a grammatical approach to the Irish language. So, grammarians, uh, Victorian grammarian academics started to put the Roman alphabet on top of the Irish language so we've inherited that today so it should be it, you shouldn't be looking at that it should all be learned by ear yeah <laughs> shouldn't be looking at that. <laughs> there's I just remember the song <laughs> there's a friend of mine called Louis back in Ireland and his name has oh, yeah. nine letters I think Louis so Louis has nine letters so it's L U A I D H A I G H. Louis. <laughs> That's Louis. L U A. And there's a lot, like the Welsh have a lot of, uh, what do they call consonants Sim similar. in a row. Yeah. We have a lot of vowels in a row. So uh, Louis is L U A I D H A I G H. Yeah, his dad, his dad is, a, is a trickster. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, cool. back here and then back up here. So you spoke about the Irish people and Irish. I'm just curious because we're a melting pot here. Do you feel you're better accepted by American audiences? <laughs> we're not. No, no. It's a yeah, that's it's a very, very interesting you'd ask that. Yeah, very interesting you'd ask it. I'd love to ask why you'd ask that question because <laughs> um, 
It is a profound experience here and one that many, there's an amazing interplay of relationship between Ireland and the US. Um, for many, there's a great book by an Irish writer called Colin McCann called Transatlantic. Transatlantic by Colin McCann, a beautiful novel, beautiful novel. And he takes three sort of vignettes to express in story the relationship, the interplay between Ireland and the US. Uh, so it's very common that Irish, the Irish energy comes to this country, which is a melting pot, mm. and gets to find and speak a voice that within its sort of monocultural little island it, it is too close to actually say. So we've certainly had that experience over here that, um, again, a parity of esteem. Mm. That so being Irish, uh, we have to compete with all the other cultures over here. So we have to really um, find the value in what we do in a different way than we do, would at home, yeah. So it's a fascinating yeah. question like that. There know? is, and also this thing about tradition and innovation with us, the precipice that we've come to where we're taking our baby step, our one baby, because we're all just pushed to the edge and we all can only take one baby step in our short lives. The baby <laughs> step we've taken is on this speaking platform of some sort, whether it's a spiritual or poetic or, or constructive. So our parents, we grew up watching them speak in musical concert, presenting poetry and speaking about certain parts of wisdom and philosophical and spiritual ideas, but in a musical concert. Or else in an academic context, presenting poems, presenting songs, presenting ideas, presenting philosophies and opinions on an academic platform. And we never fully found or saw them on this type of platform, I suppose you could call it, which is a speaking platform. Now a speaking audience, it does not have a musical ear. It's, it's, it's open to experience. It's a very courageous and small audience because it's a very vulnerable thing. When you're being spoken to, you're kind of stuck, aren't you? You can't get up and leave. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> it's harder to get up and leave, you know what I mean? <laughs> you're not drinking beers and you can just leave whenever you want. But, um, so yes, The Great Leveller was also speaking and that gave us a lot of courage and the ability to mix all the genres and ideas together. You know. But specifically, this, th this country has had that extraordinary experience of people from all over the world coming here um, over a recorded history of a couple of hundred years. And um, yeah, it, there's something very special about the experience here yeah. in this country. Um, I think it's no accident, too, you know, that this conversation is happening here, you know. Um, so uh, the speaker is held in high esteem here in the United States. And I think that's probably an echo of the archetype of the preacher, which is not very far away from your uh, from this very landscape as well. Did you have something? I was just interested in the language, but in Ireland now, does everybody speak English or does anybody live this language daily? There's little pockets that are just hanging on very tentatively, very tenaciously, and... Uh, so morally, would you say? Yeah, just Jolly on the coast, three, three places along the coast, mm -hmm. and then one little place on the... Yes, yeah, there's, it, there, there, it, are, there, there are primary and secondary schools. It, and interestingly and paradoxically, it's compulsory as a subject from K through 12, do you say? Like, a pri elementary and secondary level, it's a compulsory subject. Every person in Ireland learns it for 12 years, but they learn it as a written language, not as a spoken language. Like so it's that. learned like this, and we're all like yourself going, what? Uh, <laughs> it doesn't really add up. So there's a whole, there's a couple of generations of extremely baffled Irish people when it comes to their relationship with the language. So it's hanging on, but unfortunately, and some of our great friends are from these areas where the language is spoken as a first language. And the prognosis is not very positive from those localities, you know. They do feel like it is really being lost, yeah, yeah. So again, you know, what do you do? I remember once I saw the Dalai Lama give a live, um, a live uh, lecture uh, in this beautiful Tibetan Buddhist center that's on the west coast of Cork. Mm. Called and we were there, and we didn't know we were there um, at this big uh, live stream of the Dalai Lama. And so we sat down the back of the meditation hall and saw him, and he was giving a very intimate lecture to people in the Tibetan Buddhist community, you know, um, very direct, very directly to a very specific audience that understood what he was saying. Mm. And he basically said that the Tibetan 
culture is being lost by the Chinese, you know, uh, culture there. It is being lost. So he said, what we have to do is accept that and we have to acknowledge it and be realistic. And our job now is to archive, actually, and to store this wisdom around the world where future generations can access it when the time is right. You know? I remember seeing this man, and he spoke, he said it so, uh, un it was so uncomplicated <laughs> the way he said it, you know. And um, so that often comes back to me when thinking about the Irish culture. You know, so, could yeah. the style, I don't know if I'm saying this, but could the style of the language be transmitted rather than the exact words or something? You know what I mean? The style of the language. Maybe given or arising within young people? And Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully. So, Even outside of those Irish speaking. Outside Hopefully, of those Irish-speaking yes. areas, there's other schools of secondary schools, high schools that are being taught in the Irish language. And there is, uh, we've got a, a little uh, stepbrother, and he is, is he loves Irish. He's 13, so um, that's very heartening. And that's because you know they're being take it or leave it kind of education. So it becomes cool then, instead of prescribed. So it's very very promising indeed. Speaking for everyone here, but when we were youngsters, we had to learn square dance. So I'm wondering if you had to learn river dance. I'm also wondering <laughs> if you pronounce your ths as ts, and I'm also wondering <laughs> if a funny lass from St Albans meets a lovely lad from New York. Lovely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. She she's married to him, by the way. Yes. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you're looking. <laughs> Okay, nice, yeah, yeah. Yes, no, that's all, that yes is the answer to all of those questions. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, yeah, we, we learned uh, Irish dance, uh, set dancing, we call it in Ireland, set dancing. Square dancing is, I think, the, maybe the American version like, of, because all, all those traditions traveled over here and became kind of Americanified. So your partner's from the Irish set dancing, yeah. Yeah, is... and the Scots did that. And Western Europe, you know, it was European tradition was too. English and, Morris dancing. My English yeah. Morris dancing, and yeah. So, so we did a bit of that, yeah, yeah, very badly. Very badly, yeah. Now, T-H's is T's. T-H's is T's, yeah. When we're over here in America, we try to pronounce the T-H's a little bit more, yeah, we speak a little bit more slowly uh, and try to enunciate a little better. <laughs> Someone told me that the Irish uh, step dancing, you know, where the arms are very often held down, like that, was yeah. because the pubs were very crowded. And that means the pubs are very crowded. Yes, yeah, that's are true. crowded. Yes, exactly. Yeah, there's many. There's a lot of very imaginative stories. Very imaginative. About how the, I heard. I heard as well that they had to keep their arms down so that if the priest passed, they could just go <laughs> in the window. You know. Then. And I was told in Ireland once <laughs> that same thing, but it was if a British soldier passed. Oh, on the Brits, of course, as, as well. So right. Right. Yeah. But in in the in the academy that our father founded. Uh, there's, um, you can do a whole PhD on this, of the et ethnochoreology is what it's called. So um, how movement, how a society embodies itself through, through movement, you know. And it's amazing. If you ever look at clips of people dancing without any music mm -hmm. uh, from other eras or other cultures, it's just mind blowing. And you can actually get a sense of the spirit of a culture when you look at someone's dance without the music there to distract you, you know. So. But the Irish dance is a fascinating uh, basket case of tradition and innovation and the global spread of culture. As global, a, a spread of culture can, can, it can propagate culture in two different ways. One is a oral transmission that is very fluid and a summer schools type of prog uh, summer school type of structure, you know, where students would come to a group of teachers who would teach for a week and they have a concert at the end and then you go bye bye. Mm -hmm. The other way, which Irish dance is an absolute panzer division example <laughs> of, of the competition culture that can be imposed upon our expression. So what happens is an ultra orthodoxy uh, of winning. Um, <laughs> that's the only goal. So people's hands went down uh, because the guys whose hands went up were probably a little bit drunk, so they didn't win. So you win by going like that. Uh, and there is a Shannon stance for the theory. Or that's not really a theory. <laughs> <laughs> they, you don't win if, if, if you go like this. But, but, 
Yeah, I, I, and like, there's a whole other style of dance, a Shannon's dance, old style dance, where you do move the hands, and it starts to look very like tap dance. Yeah. And tap dance is what came out of Irish traditional dance when it met African American dance on uh, the vaudeville sort of stage. So um, it's interesting. Yeah, I think that point is cool. Like that, even within traditional cultures, you have the oral and the literal um, mm -hmm. conflict as well, too. You know, so the co the competition culture is a literal culture that gives you marks. Uh, whereas the oral culture is one of oral transmission through that summer school model where you're just learning from a teacher and there's no competition. So, uh, and, and then, sorry. No, well, all our societies then flip-flop between these. Our original Grecian ideals of education is to come and scribe from the orally from the teacher. And no. these days now it's complete competition culture. So yeah. it's bereft. Mm -hmm. And then, sorry, we forgot to say how I encountered this yes. extraordinary yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, creature entered my life. She walked into my kitchen. Thank you very much. It was much. very crowded. So, <laughs> we kept our arms down. <laughs> and, there was lots of priests. Andrea won a, 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 a scholarship to Ireland called the George Mitchell Scholarship that sends about 12 American scholars to Ireland every year. Uh, another great Irish-American um, uh, relations relationship called the uh, the US Ireland Alliance and so we used to host these students every year in our home for a night of music and um, and food and fun and one of those years Andrea walked in and the organizer of this whole thing woman called Trina Vargo she insists that she introduced us and knew that we would be the perfect couple <laughs> yeah so um, we, owe it, we owe it all to her. And then the, when I did meet Andrea, she was then zooming off to law school in NYU. And uh, I had to act very quickly. <laughs> before. Um, but I was in Ireland doing a master's on refugee studies in Ireland, which was also a whole other fascinating aspect of the contemporary Irish culture that we won't get into. But after many many decades of being a country of people leaving. Very recently, it became a country of people coming in from all over the world. Um, so they were really setting up immigration policy for the very first time around the year 2000. And Owen doesn't talk about it too much, but has a whole background in philosophy and peace and development studies. So I was doing a master's on refugee studies, which he had done maybe four or five years before and was working with refugees in Limerick. So we had a very academic responsible reason to keep in touch. Indeed. To this With day. That, I will leave you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. But yes, thank you so much. Thank you for moderating. Okay. Because